quantum mechanics is telling us that things are not what the world is made of. It's made of processes. Um, okay, quantum entanglement. Well, I would start with I would start with describing quantum physics in general as uh, as composed of two rules and only two rules, and there's no math. And that's true. The foundations are not built on math. They're built on the fact that quantum objects are waves. The the first one says that quantum objects, because they're waves, they can be they can be prepared in what we call uh, states of superposition. Rule number two is the one that maybe by itself is not a big deal, but taken together with rule number one is very hard. Rule number two says that, yes, quantum things are waves. They can be in many places at the same time. But rule number two says that's only true as long as you don't look. And that by itself is, it, everything is weird about it. It's, those two rules are, are uh, in direct contra uh, contrast to one another. You can't derive one rule from the other. They're not unified in any way, and in physics we hate that. Outcome, if I take two particles, whether it's photons, atoms, whatever, that their states are connected to one another so that if I separate them and make a measurement on one, it tells me something about the properties of the other one. In the quantum world, there are properties that systems can have systems that are composed of more than one part can have properties that cannot be reduced to properties of the individual subsystems. Whenever particle A has a certain property, particle B has a certain corresponding property, and vice versa. You know, if you have uh, two friends, let's say a couple, uh, and you ask, like, you know, are they good for each other? Do they fit together as a couple? you tend to think that that means like this person has, you know, Alice has a certain personality and likes and dislikes and Bob has a personality and likes and dislikes and do they fit together well. But really, who a person is depends on who they're interacting with. It's like Alice may have one personality when she's with Bob but a different personality when she's with Charlie. Just a different part of her sort of comes out or is manifested or even exists because she responds differently in that. So the, the personality of the relationship of two people would be like an entanglement property that can't be reduced to just saying, well, Bob is this way and Alice is this way, so when you put them together, they're this way. It's like they are who they are in relation to the person they're interacting with. You know, there's another analogy to entanglement uh, that, that I like to use. Um, why don't you point that up here? Um, it, it, it's a, it, 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 um, it revolves around an optical illusion, which, mm -hmm. which is good because quantum mechanics is weird, so are optical illusions. Well, it involves perspective. Mm -hmm. you've, all, you've all drawn cubes on a blackboard. And if you draw it with, with, if you draw it with correct perspective, these lines have to kind of, they're not parallel, they approach a point. But let's draw it with all these lines being parallel. Okay. That cube has ambiguous perspective. You know, is this, is this the front face, or is this the front face? Is it pointing up or to the left? That's a little like a quantum superposition. Two states at the same time, and in fact your mind sees both, it kind of flips back over. But when you lock onto one perspective, you typically stay there. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot like a quantum measurement. It pops into one. Now the great thing about this, this, this um, analogy is that it, we can also talk a little bit about entanglement by drawing two of them. Probably see where this is going. Okay, now these are two degrees of freedom, two cubes. There are four possibilities here, right? Mm -hmm. This can be down to the left, down to the right. This can be down to the left or up into the right. Now, your mind will tend to see both perspectives, but they will be correlated usually. You probably see both of them down to the left, both of them up into the right. It's a little like entanglement, because when you measure one, when one pops into one state, the other one usually pops into the same state, even though you weren't looking at that one. It's that it simply does There are situations in quantum mechanics where it just doesn't even have the definite property until it comes into interaction with other systems that kind of um, force it to 
uh, play its hand. It's, you know, it, it's spooky action at a distance, but it's not really spooky at all. Um, in a sense, what's spooky is quantum mechanics is a theory about our knowledge of nature. It's not a theory about nature. And if you accept that, then none of these so-called paradoxes are really paradoxical. In fact, Einstein, I think, was bothered by the high idea of entanglements. It seemed like something faster than light was happening. You measure one system, and you immediately know, wherever the other system is, you immediately know that it's in some particular state. That seems like, that seems like it's faster than light communication, but it's not communication because if you do it over and over again, it's going to be just random. All right. If I have, if I have, uh, I, I think in terms of coins a lot. If I have, a, if I have a, quant a pair of quantum coins that are correlated, you flip them and they're both heads all the time, or they're both tails all the time. That's weird. I almost never see that. They have to be some somebody cooking the books. But if this is happening over a large distance, all I have to do is flip my coin. I see heads. I know you have heads. The problem is, what if I do it again? I get tails. It'll be totally random. So I can't. I don't learn anything from you. So you can't. No, you can't no use it to encode faster. You can use it to encode and then also make a phone call to encrypt, but that's not faster than light. And so Einstein, I think, didn't put this together. He didn't know information theory. That was more, you know, later after you know, after he died. Information theory tells us what how, you know, that random numbers carry no information. And so maybe he shouldn't have been so bothered. Einstein shouldn't have been so bothered by it. Um, you know, suppose like. You know, you mix up your gloves and uh, you take uh, the right glove from one set of gloves in a, in a basket and the left glove from another one. And then you get to, you know, wherever you're going, you go, oh shoot, I didn't bring the left glove. Then you know that the left glove of that pair is sitting in that basket over there. And if you had taken the left glove, then it would be the right glove that was in the basket. So there's a correlation between which glove I have and which one is in the basket, because they come in pairs. And, you know, that's in a sense a kind of entanglement. Whatever I have, the basket has the opposite one. But the difference is in quantum mechanics, the thing I could have would, could be neither a left glove nor a right glove. It could be either one depend, just probabilistically determined by what I, when I look at it, it turns out, oh, it's a right glove. But it wasn't the right glove until I actually it manifested itself. It might have been a left glove just as well. But whatever it is, it turns out the other one is the opposite one. If you think about the electron as something that is a probability in this almost trippy way, where you know it's like two things at the same time, and whoa, that's so crazy, then it is weird. Then, then you are changing it by making it switch from something that's two things to just one thing. But in, in sort of my intuition, um, in sort of the, uh, the everyday intuition where things are one thing or another thing, <laughs> um, it was always either spin up or spin down, and you just found out about it. And just the same way that if you found the left glove, you'd know that the other missing glove was a right glove, no matter where it was in your house. It's not, I mean, information would also travel faster than the speed of light in that example. The problem is that in quantum mechanics, you can do experiments that show that things really are two things at once. Because when I make a measurement, one way out is to say, well, if I make a measurement, I become entangled with the system. I experience one result, and I experience the other result at the same time. So my brain is entangled with this. The problem is, I don't know what that means, I've never experienced two things at the same time. So there's that. I don't want to get into consciousness, I don't understand it. Yeah. Now one, one approach, and this is out there, I think, is, is that the universe actually splits into two. By doing something quantum mechanical, by opening the box and seeing if Schrodinger's cat is dead or alive, you are creating two universes, one in which the cat is dead and one in which the cat is alive. And both of those universes proceed and, and you, your experience sort of goes into one or the other, but there's sort of another you that opened the box and saw that the cat was dead or whatever. It, the Many Worlds Hypothesis is neat it's clean, it's untestable. In the end, I'm a sort of practicing quantum mechanics person, so it's sort of the shut up and calculate school of thought, which is, um, and so when you get into issues of like multiple universes or all these various interpretations, that's really philosophy. So 
if, if there's another interpretation, so for instance, multiple universes is a perfectly fine view of the world, but it does not make any predictions different than the standard, say, Copenhagen School of Quantum Mechanics. So in some sense, they're not different theories. They're different philosophical views of the theories. So this gets to the heart of, it, 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 it does kind of rub on the definition of what is, is, what is reality. This atom's over here, I can label it. This atom's a different one for sure, but it's the information that's contained in the atom that gives it its personality. As far as anyone could tell, it's the exact same atom because it yep, yep. has the same information in it. And I could say something more definite. There is no possible experiment that could tell the difference. So therefore, we can say it's the same thing. When you do quantum mechanics, you have to think of real things as probabilities of real things. What this is all telling us is that we shouldn't think about the world as being composed of things. And we get into trouble if we do, because then we have to say, well, did the thing go here or here? But there's no thing. There's just the process that spit the electron out over here. There's the process that detected it over here. And there's the environment it's going through with the screen and the slits. And the electron is the whole process. Then somehow uh, we don't get in as much trouble trying to figure out how one thing could be in two places at once. This business about what is a measurement or a definite thing that happens in quantum mechanics, when can you say that something definite happened? Sometimes I think that's still a problem in the theory. It seems like there's something wrong in how we talk about probability in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what it is. You know, if you press me, until a couple of years ago, and I would say, well, probably it's obvious what it is. You just repeat the experiment a hundred times, and if something happens 74 times on average, then it's sort of 74% likely to happen. That's the probability of it happening. But of course, in any hundred times realization of the experiment, it may happen 78 times, or 73, or there's some distribution. So, so to really verify a problem, it could even happen once if there was a big statistical fluctuation, right? So what is nature telling us if it's saying there's a certain probability of something happening? So then you go, okay, it's saying if you do the experiment an infinite number of times, then, you know, you beat down all the statistical fluctuations and you know as n goes to infinity, where n is the number of times you do the experiment, you'll converge to exactly 74% of the time something happening. But that's a kind of mathematically abstract definition. We don't do anything an infinite number of times in nature. We've never confirmed a, a prediction that referred to an infinite number of experiments, right? There's only a finite number of people that ever lived. And so, and, and they lived a finite amount of time and did a finite number of experiments. So, uh, so then you say, okay, it's an idealization, but how can the very logic of nature be built on an idealization which by its very nature could never be realized? It's too abstract. So I don't believe that that's a set of, I just can't believe that the world is built that way, that the laws of nature refer to something that's never realizable like probability. So if you, once you accept that, then you say, okay, well, then what do you mean by probability? And uh, I don't know. And certainly the fact that we still have to reconcile quantum mechanics with, with general relativity, that we've, we've got to find out how these things cross over in the middle, means that we don't have a completely clear picture of, of either end yet. Um, and there's, there's still theorizing to be added, definitely. We, we don't know everything about this yet.